Live from Los Angeles. Los Angeles. It's time to get inside. The Gamer's Dome with your host, Scott Gerhardt. Bringing you all of today's gaming news and information all in one place. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Welcome to the Gamer's Dome. Welcome, everyone, to episode 28 of the Gamer's Dome. I am your host, Scott Gerhart, and joining us this week, we have a longtime friend of the show. You may remember him from the Inside the Gamer's Dome episode, uh, Sean Durham. Hey, Sean, how's it going? They may remember me or they may not, uh, but uh, either way, here I am. Yay. Okay, so, Sean, tell me, uh, well, let, let's start off here. Tell me a little bit about your week. How you been? Uh, you know, up and down, up and down. Um, having a lot of fun with uh, the M14 stuff, uh, but um, certainly not doing as much gaming as I'd like to. I guess that's true of all of us. Yeah, there's only so many hours in the day, unfortunately. I, I wish I could game more uh, myself. I have I actually got to do a little bit of gaming uh, this last weekend. Um, it just wasn't necessarily the type of gaming that we often talk about. Now, you were in Vegas again, right? Uh, I was in Vegas. So, um, so yeah, I did a little bit of uh, blackjack, a little bit of craps, a little bit of roulette, a couple spins of the slot machines. Um, that's always some fun gaming right there. Uh, so, ahead or behind? You know, when it all was said and done, I, um, I went down just a little bit, but... Um, honestly, for the amount that I played, I was more than good with it. More than anything, I actually stayed at Circus Circus. And they have a Midway and their Adventure Dome, and they have a bunch of crane machines. And uh, I like crane machines. So um, I actually had a lot of fun with uh, those. So well worth the money money spent either way then, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I have um, I have a bunch of random... Like despicable me minions now, and I I have a unicorn too. Is it a fluffy unicorn? It it's so fluffy, I'm gonna die. <laughs> now, did you get to see number two, or have you? Uh, I ha- not I, quite gone in there yet. I actually have seen two. I watched one and two within a few days of each other. I'd never seen one until recently. And then oh. I watched it, and a few days later I saw two, and uh, I th- I thought it was cute. I I love the franchise. Uh, the only problem I have with it is my my wife and I go to see these movies in the theater, and there we are in the center of the theater with no kids whatsoever, and everyone else is bringing in kids. So I think we need to rent a kid, so that we don't look quite so strange <laughs> showing up to these movies. But... <laughs> Uh, no, you know what? I think plenty of adults get it, and uh, there's plenty of humor in there for, for the adults, so. Yeah. Well, Big fan of the shows. I, I, I don't think that this is the uh, the gamer's movie review, though. I think we should probably <laughs> maybe talk a little bit of gaming. Well, they have to have a Despicable Me 2 game coming out sometime, man. Hmm. One can hope. Okay, on to the games. Okay. Let's start with the uh, game that, according to an Amazon UK poll, has now been hailed as the game of the generation. And the winner is, drumroll, that was a horrible drumroll, by the way, uh, Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Mm. Any surprise yeah. there? No, well, of this generation, yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. Um, so th- there were a number of, of votes that would get you eligible in. So the 16 that actually made the bracketing um, were uh, Batman Arkham City, Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, uh, Skyrim, Fallout 3, Far Cry 3, Grand Theft Auto 4, The Last of Us, Mass Effect 2, Metal Gear Solid 4, 
Super Mario Galaxy, Portal 2, Uncharted 2, Among Thieves, and The Walking Dead. That's a pretty good list to choose from. Yeah, you know, coming out ahead out of that pack is definitely something to be said for it. And, you know, with the size of it and the modding community and just everything that went into it, I, I can definitely see Skyrim as the uh, the number one contender among that list. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly uh, every one of those are great games. And obviously, for clarification for everyone, we're talking just, just video games in this list. The board games and card games weren't included, so... I, I I might be a little biased towards them, but eh, that's just me. I'm a bit of a card game junkie myself. Okay, so speaking of something that I know you and I happen to share, uh, Blizzard games. <laughs> um, uh, Sean and I actually met playing World of Warcraft. So, uh, I obviously have a little bit of interest in what they're putting out next, and we've been hearing about Titan for quite some time. Well, Titan doesn't look like it's going to be what Titan was going to be anymore. Yeah, I'm kind of curious on this one. Um, you know, uh, coming out with another MMO is everyone, was what everyone expected Blizzard to do with, uh, of course, their massive success with... Uh, with Warcraft, but what else could they be doing is a, is a question of itself. It seems to me like whatever they had has been scrapped, and they're keeping the Titan name around just for continuity, but whatever Titan is now or is being developed, I, I firmly believe is either nothing at all like it originally was or just barely has... A few remnants of the old thing. I I, I don't know. Um, and it, it's I, it's also possible that they're maybe going to do something that's microtransaction based. You know, I, I've seen game company. I, I've worked in game companies before, and I've seen them do this with projects before. Normally, they'll keep the story, the art design, and do what's called a a technology review. Um, you know, if it took five years to put it out, well, you start working with technology five years ago, you're going to have to completely scrap it and redo it to keep up with the technology that's going to be out five years from now. So it may be that they've uh, scrapped the engine behind it, but they're still keeping the basic story and art direction of the project. Yeah, and, well, I mean, there you go. Guy who's worked at it, and, and I, I tend to agree that that would be my novice opinion on it. But uh, I, I trust yours a little bit more. That's probably what it is. They they had the story that they liked, and now it's just not going to work with whatever project they had. So, uh, and you know, it's all speculation from my point because I do not work for Blizzard. But uh, yeah, uh, that would be my guess. Yeah, and, and Mike Morheim said, and the quote from him is. Quote, we're in the process of selecting a new direction for the project and re-envisioning what we want the game to be. While we can't talk about the details yet, it is unlikely to be a subscription-based MMORPG. That that tells me it, I think they're looking at the microtransaction. I think they're wanting to do some things with Titan, maybe that they felt like they never could do with World of Warcraft. Like, you may be able, you may be able to buy gear. Hmm. Oh, Blizzard's getting closer to that. Yeah, they're they're getting very close, but oh well. Have, have you seen the new helmets? I've actually not. I've been not very active in WoW lately. Uh, they are uh, on the public test realm. They currently have a um, an option to buy an XP boost. Uh, this is strictly on the PTR, so it may not ever make it to the. To the uh, the live servers. That's. But, I think I actually. Now, nah, as you're saying this, this is kind of ringing a bell. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and they also have uh, three different helmets, which are uh, very visual looking um, type things. You know, burning helms type stuff. Um, but it's only available through the microtransaction system. So the, they are coming closer. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's jump off that. Let's talk some Saints Row 4. So, apparently, there are going to be seven radio stations with 109 different songs split up uh, amongst the stations. And I don't claim to be the most musically knowledgeable person, like, at all. And, like, Though some of these are very funny, like there's a classic station that's got just, I mean, it's classics. I mean, uh, Chopin, uh, Strauss, Bach, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. There's um, there's The Mix, 107.77. I, I got most of those songs. I know a lot of those. <laughs> Things like Aerosmith's I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Uh, Blur song number two is on there. That made me happy. Uh, there's some Paul Abdul, President of the United States, Romantics. Hey, the safety dance. Can't have a game without that. Can't have it without the safety dance. And a lot of these. So it's kind of neat having the various stations and having these songs that you know and recognize in the game. Um, and I, don't know, I, th- I think it's neat. I just. It's not a franchise I'm particularly into so much, but. Like what they've done, and, and like even the thought that they put into this, and then obviously the licenses that they had to obtain to get them in the game. So I, I, I give them credit for not going with just some random, we're going to compose it music and just throwing it there. They're getting real songs that people know. Yeah, and a lot of them the choice, which is definitely uh, groundbreaking for a, a game soundtrack. So, League of Legends, uh, the World Championship schedule for that got recently announced. It's going to be held at the. Um, it's going to be held here in Southern California, and by here I mean here for me, not here for, for Sean, who's up, up there in the Upper Peninsula. Well, actually, you're not in the Upper Peninsula. You're in the state adjacent to it, though, right? Uh, no, actually, I'm as about as far up on the Upper Peninsula as you can get. Oh, are uh, you? My front lawn is Canada. Yeah, I knew that. Okay. So, there we go. This is why it's not the Geography Dome either. <laughs> um, so, we we already knew that the semifinal and final matches were going to be uh, taking place at the USC Galen Center and Staples Center. Um, thus far, uh, we still don't actually know what the... Well, I guess we do know what it is. I just don't see where it is. It's the article is making me leading me to believe that uh, the the third one has been announced. I just don't see where it is. So uh, from what I've heard, um, a Los- it was just described as a Los Angeles studio. Yeah, it says the they p- haven't said which one it is. Okay, so I'm not misreading that. Um, the studio is going to showcase group stage matches uh, September 15 through 17, September 19 through 21, and the. Uh, they'll broadcast the quarterfinal matches September 23rd and 24th. So there's going to be uh, more details on um, LOL Esports coming up soon. Yeah, the first time I heard about that website, I thought that they were kidding. Yeah, I know. <laughs> LOL Esports. Ah. <laughs> uh, you, you ever play any Street Fighter, Sean? I, I played the original Street Fighter even. Wow. Um, I, I I certainly like a little Street Fighter. Um, if you want Street Fighter Five, it's right around the corner. If you consider 2018 to be right around the corner. And which, I mean, I guess looking at the timeline that they put out, it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I can't pronounce his name. Tomoaki Ayano? Um, I wouldn't even touch that one. Producer, Capcom producer was talking about, he said, uh, game development is a long and arduous process. If you look in the history of the series, it took six years to go from Street Fighter 2 to 3 and nine years to go from 3 to 4. So it's not completely unrealistic that 2018 would be when it's going to hit. It's not that they're necessarily making us wait. They just have to actually develop the game. You know, I, I think I prefer it this way. 
I think I like the idea that they're doing major steps between each version and not just re-releasing the same version every year with minor character changes. Yeah, no, I agree. If you're going to make a new game, make a new game. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's Street Fighter, so it's going to be Street Fighter. But yeah, if you're going to make a new game, make a new game. So I I agree. Uh, Take the time, put it in, put out a quality title. Uh, Sony. Uh, let's let's jump on Sony here. So we already know that the PlayStation 4 is supposed to retail at 399. But we have a an anonymous source and we always know how well on uh how correct anonymous tends to be. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh there's been an announcement that uh there may be a $500 PlayStation 4 and Vita bundle which uh, that's pretty good considering that the Vita is currently two fifty. I mean, I would expect a price break on that, but still, essentially dropping it down to a hundred dollars would be, for me, if I'm going to get a PlayStation Four, if I don't own a Vita, I'm probably just going to get the bundle. Yeah, I can certainly see that. I'm, I haven't been much of a uh, PlayStation guy. I'm, I'm on the other side. I'm still. With the Xbox and uh, the Wii, uh, but um, <laughs> the, there are times which uh, Sony really comes out, and I'll tell you, they won the E3 hard. Oh so, yeah, uh, yeah, they they wiped the floor with Microsoft. And it's um, it's slowly converting me over. It looks like it's going to be a good system. I mean, it's all speculation until they actually hit the market, but. We shall see. So, something that came out recently is a... um, I'm sure everyone out there is familiar with The Legend of Zelda. Uh, The Legend of Zelda, actually, back in 2007, um, Astro Boy Company, Imagi, and Animation Studios, uh, actually put together a CGI pitch for a Zelda movie. That is now uh, becoming public. Yeah, the thought scares me, honestly. Yeah, it's one of those... Like, I like the idea that they could make a movie, but I'm just scared that they're going to do it wrong. Matter of fact, I'm confident that they would do it wrong. Uh, there's no way to do it right. Everyone has their own memories and uh, thoughts of the what Zelda is. Um, but more likely... Uh, more. What more scares me is Nintendo's track record with movies. I mean, the Super Mario Brother movie, um, The Wizard. um, Can you name any good Nintendo-based movie here? Oh, heck, we even got the Super Mario Brothers Super Show with Captain Lou Albano. Ah, yes. What? Yes. I mean, don't get me wrong. That was so bad it was good. (laughs) But... I I, I, agree, I agree. The track record's not been good, and please don't don't bastardize my childhood memories. Poor favor. Exactly. But that being said, the animation on it actually did look pretty good. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. No. The, the 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 pitch looked great. So, uh, Temple Run. Have you pl- have you played any Temple Run, Sean? Um. Uh, no, no. That one I can say that I have not gotten into. I I've played it. I I don't see the fascination with it, but apparently a lot of people do, as well as uh, Usain Bolt, the uh, famous uh, fastest man in the world, is going to be a playable character in Temple Run Two. He'll be the first uh, guest star, if you will. And uh, he will cost everyone a grand sum of 99 cents if they want to play with him. Okay. Yeah, well, that's... I, I guess uh, big fans of um, Hussein could could certainly fork out the money. and. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of like, uh, it's neat, it's cool, it, it doesn't really blip on... Like, my, oh my god, I've got to go spend 99 cents right now to get Usain Bolt rather than the default dude. 
Now, you know, he is the uh, the Olympic champion, like six six times, seven times over. He, he's got a lot. He's got a lot of medals. Yeah, uh, and he is just um, amazing. I mean, they they even um, had a group of physicists work on why he's so fast. I mean, this guy is just phenomenal. Yeah, he's... but in a video game, I don't know. Hmm. I hope he at least I'm, runs faster than the other guy does. Yeah, you you would hope so. So let's jump back to Sony here. Um, Sony is keeping the uh, MMORPG flame alive, if you uh, believe the headlines here, with EverQuest Next and EverQuest Next Landmark. Uh, Sean, you, you used to play EverQuest, right? I've played EverQuest 1 uh, for a few years, and uh, EverQuest 2. Um, I got into it uh, for EverQuest people around Kunark, um, and I uh, stayed for it with it for a few years. Uh, popped into Warcraft, though, and never never went back. So what? tell me your thoughts, because admittedly, I never played the old EverQuest. I started my MMOs with with World of Warcraft. Give me your opinion on what you're seeing here with uh, with EverQuest Next. Well, the first thing they did, um, it looks like, is they made it pretty. Uh, that That's uh, true of every reincarnation of EverQuest, is they, they bump up the, the polygons, they smooth out the graphics, they make it look just uh, light years ahead of the old product. Um, but the the two things that you're talking about with uh, with Landmark and uh, EverQuest Next uh, that they're going to be doing is kind of neat. A la Minecraft. Now, Minecraft is popular immensely so because people get to build their own worlds. And that's essentially what EverQuest Next Landmark is going to do. It's going to give you a sandbox where you can build your own cities and houses and landscapes for EverQuest. Um, this then gets integrated possibly with the EverQuest Next by um, EverQuest Next Engine, which allows you to not only build but destroy. Um, go out to the ruins of whatever and knock down a few walls. Um the hordes will start attacking, blow a hole through a wall, and hit them from the side. I mean, this is something that isn't done in MMOs because you can't really change the landmark, uh, the, the landscape in just about anything nowadays. Yeah. The closest thing I've seen to it was the old Star Wars MMO, um, where you could actually build cities out on. Tatooine or whatever it was, uh, which was really neat. Um, long before the combat review, basically destroyed the game. Um, but yeah, uh, it looks like EverQuest is bringing it back in a big way, and it could um, it could certainly mark a new uh, landmark for other MMOs to achieve. I mean, we'll see. I mean, lately it's been World of Warcraft and everyone else trying to play catch up with it. But the thing I like is that even when these new games come out, even if they don't necessarily do well, uh, they often can produce something new that maybe hadn't been thought of before. And the idea of, you're right, being able to change terrain and landscape within an MMO is quite the revolutionary concept. So uh, hopefully, hopefully it will do well, or at the very least... Uh, provide some interesting um, things for... A new benchmark for others to to add into their product as well. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so I have two more news stories I want to cover, and I'm just going to mention them right now. I'm not even going to talk about them. Actually, really three. Um, And they're all Magic the Gathering related. One involves the Hall of Fame class for 2013, which got recently announced. The second one involves From the Vault 20, which is uh, cards from the first, uh, the first 20 years of Magic, which is where we're at now. And the last one involves a World's Week, which recently wrapped up in Amsterdam. 
The reason I'm going to hold over all three of these news stories is when we come back, our guest is going to be um, a magic judge, commentator, and good friend of the show, Sheldon Mennery, who was actually in Amsterdam for World's Week. We're going to hear all about that from him. So I want to kind of cover those news stories as we start working um, that interview. So... Um, you have anything else you want to say right now before we uh, go to break here, Sean? I'll see you after these messages. Perfect. You are listening to the Gamer's Dome on the Drawing Board Radio Network. Looking for Magic the Gathering singles? Shuffle and Cut Games' friendly staff has provided gamers one of the Internet's biggest selections of singles since 2000. And if you have extra cards you don't need anymore, Shuffle and Cut Games is one of the most extensive buy lists around, paying top dollar for your unwanted cards. If you live near our La Habra, California location, come down and play in our weekly Friday Night Magic tournaments. For more info, visit ShuffleandCut.com. That's Shuffle, A-N-D, Cut.com. Shuffle and Cut Games, your source for Magic the Gathering. Attention techno fans, you're listening to Electro Motion by Studiotronics. Just one of the many exciting tracks from their album, Straight From The Source. Stimulate your brain and get your body moving to these high energy cuts. Also, check out their newest single available for download, Electro. Don't just sit there, get your fix for Studiotronics. Now available at iTunes, Amazon.com and CDBaby.com. Scott here for Loot Crate. If you want to get the best and coolest geek and gamer stuff delivered right to your door every month, then you've got to get a Loot Crate. We've been doing these unboxings for, I don't know, three or so months on YouTube, and they're just awesome. I mean, each month you're getting like 30 bucks worth of stuff shipped right to you with a new theme every month, like equip, mashup, token, and more. I've yet to open a disappointing box, and knowing these guys, I never will. You can get your own today with a special discount just for our listeners. They're normally $13.37 a month, but head over to LootCrate.com and enter in the promo code DOME to get 10% off. For the price of a cheap game download, you get shirts, bags, toys, plushes, stickers, and more. You never know what they're going to ship that month. It's great. So just head over to LootCrate.com, sign up with promo code DOME for 10% off. You'll be glad you did. Again, that's Loot, L-O-O-T, Crate.com, promo code DOME for 10% off. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gamer Stone. So, as I said before the break, we are going to cover a few uh, Magic the Gathering related news stories. So, joining us here, you may remember him from a, uh, a previous episode that we had. We have uh, Judge Emeritus, we have Magic Commentator Extraordinaire. And just overall, good guy, Sheldon Mennery. Sheldon, how you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Okay, so you were. Let, let's start with. Let's start with. Actually, actually, I'm going to interrupt you before we start. Okay. Um, I, there's there's a very important thing I need to mention, and uh, I need all Magic players and all gamers of all stripes to unite behind this cause. I was playing Words of Wonder about an hour ago, and the word untap was not a valid word. Oh! So we need a petition, um, we need a petition or something. Right in campaign. Seriously, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah, so like, let's get everybody to work on that. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. First. Oh, no, no. We, we, we accept causes on the show. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's start with World's Week, because uh, that was... Uh, I, I wasn't there myself, but uh, from everything I've read, thrilling, it seems. It was, it was the most ambitious and amazing uh, magic coverage event in the history of magic. In addition, we had two of the most am amazing magic tournaments in the history of magic. Yeah. Uh, 
It was it was it was absolutely crazy. I mean, I, I got to tell you, uh, I'm still really tired. Um, it was it was a very very long week of work, but very rewarding, very fulfilling. So what what stood out? Let's let's start with the team side of it. So um, our our team world champion would be France right now with a. Uh, Rafael Levy and his um, countrymen winning that one. What? Wee oui, wee. Oui. What? Wee oui, wee. Oui. It's it's Levy, right? Levy. Levy. Uh, yes. Yeah. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, wee oui, wee. Oui. Gotcha. Oh man, I I gotta wake up before I do these shows. Um, what stood out for me for you um on that side of the bracket? What what did you see that really? Like well, maybe... a teams the, a, a teams event like we saw last year um, at the World Magic Cup, the teams event brings a different style of play. It's not just a team event where you know three people build decks together. It's it's really a joint effort when they when they play. You know, you've got especially when we got to day two, you had three players playing and a coach who was floating back and forth between the matches and giving advice and working out lines of play and discussing combat math. And it was really exciting to be uh, right there as uh, this tremendous energy built in the room as they were playing. Uh, certainly the, the French, the French team top decking. Uh, yeah. The Rakdos is returning the semifinals is, is going to go down in uh, magic history as one, you know, one of the great moments in magic. Yeah, just the, literally snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Oh. Well, I actually, I actually think that if Hungary wins that, it's a more amazing story because at one point the life totals were twenty-seven to one, and the Hungarians came back from that, and I mean that was really would have been snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Wow, I, I, I didn't get to cover it or follow it quite as close. That's insane. Yeah, the, the, the whole. That whole game and that whole match was insane. It was just the the coverage for those of you who didn't get to watch it. The coverage is up in the archives on uh, MagicGathering.com. Uh, go to the event coverage section. You can watch any match you want to from either the World Magic Cup or the World Championship, and you you'll see a lot of great magic on camera. Yeah, I've, I've got to go back and watch that match. I've heard uh, quite a bit about it already. Uh, but especially hearing you talk about it now, it's uh, that's something I'm going to be doing at some point here uh, very soon. So let's let's jump over to um, let's jump over to the individuals here. So we had um, uh, Shahar Shenhar taking home the uh, world championship, uh, beating Reed three three Duke in the finals three two and. If I'm not mistaken, Reed was up 2-0 in that match, wasn't he? Yeah, he was indeed. Um, uh, I got to say, it was it was a very tight, very tense, very interesting match. Uh, Reed took the, two, the, the first two games. Shahar realized, Shahar is a great player, despite the fact that he's 19 years old. He's a great player with, of great poise. So being in a being in a matchup that's probably pretty unfavorable to him in the first place, although I don't think it was as unfavorable as most people say it was. Um, well, Reed's only, what, 23, isn't it? Yeah, Reed's... Uh, but, I mean, four years, uh, that's the difference between... 19 and 23 is the difference between, you know, a, a college freshman and a college senior. So oh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of time in between there. But Shahar is practically unflappable so be in town be in town two games to nothing i'm sure that his thought process was i gotta win these games one at a time and he had a plan going in he knew how he was going to win the game he wasn't going to win he wasn't going to win a protracted game like his deck is built to do so he had to squeeze a little extra mileage out of it uh it was a really tough it was really tough to stand there and watch reed mulligan to four in game five with so much on the line, but I got to tell you, he is such a great champion, such a such a just quality human being that he he took a really really bad beat like a real gentleman, and uh, my my hat is definitely tipped off to him. 
Yeah, I've I've only met him once. I played him in in GP San Diego, and he crushed me. Uh, and he was, I mean, just uh, that's my experience with him. And he was just amazing through the whole thing. Um, yeah. Meeting him there and, and seeing him there uh, made me happy. Um, so, were, was there anything else from the from the single side that you necessarily saw that you thought was interesting? Or, I mean, yeah, I, I thought the finals itself was interesting because from everything. I was reading, and I could tell it looked like Reed was was heavily favored to win just based on the matchup alone. And then to be up 2-0 for Shahar to realize uh, I'm I'm down 2-0 to a deck that I'm in in trouble against to begin with, and then to come back and win three straight just seems, I mean, a 19-year-old's poise at the World Championship Finals. That's insane. Yeah, the the whole the whole. World Championship Tournament is very, very interesting to me because you have you, you bring together 16 of the best players in the world and you pit them off against each other. And you can see, I mean, 8-4 was, was getting you to the top four. That's how closely packed they are in skill level. So they, they went out and played their hearts out. I, these guys are just absolute masters of the game. You watch them play and you watch them play and you watch them play and you just realize how much better at magic they are than you are. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and you're right. It's not like there's a single bad player. I mean, when, like when Eric Froehlich finishes 14th out of the 16th, I mean, you, that, that field is insane. I mean, any of these, any one of these 16 players could have potentially well, won this tournament. Easily. And, I mean, you have to remember that Reed Duke finished dead last last year at the same tournament. And uh, I talked to him before the event, and he told me that he came in with a different mindset, a different approach. He said that last year he kind of felt like he wanted to show that he actually belonged in this group, and he took more of a defensive approach to to playing the, the game. And this year he knew that he actually did belong in the group. So he was he set out from day one – he set out to win that thing, and uh, uh, he came really, really close. Um, they, all those guys can play. Uh, you know that it's down to very thin slivers of skill at the at the top of the game, and uh, I love that tournament. It's got to be. I, I mean, I love I love the World Magic Cup, but the World Championships got to be my favorite tournament because we see magic at a completely different level. Yeah, and um, and oh, go ahead, Sean. I only had one issue with uh, the top 16. And it's something that has been talked about a little bit probably every year, is that the decks that arrived were basically the same decks that I see at F&M's. Um, things that people have downloaded off the internet from Star City Games a million times before. I mean, American Control versus Jund with uh, the same Huntmaster, Olivia, Thragtusk that you see time and time again. And I've always felt that there are two parts of magic. One is the skill and the play. And don't get me wrong, these guys are above and beyond skilled and their play is absolutely uh, poised and perfect. But their creativity in building the decks, I mean... It's the same decks over and over again that we see showing up. I mean, out of the 16 tops, I think there may have been three different decks. Um, yeah, I'd have to go back and look over what actually got played if, to agree with you there, Sean. Um, I, the field seemed pretty diverse to me. Uh, there, was, there was a certain amount of things that you would expect to see, and... The, one of the, I mean, one of the skills of the best players is realizing what the best deck is to play. Now, I talked to a bunch of these guys before the event started, and and I asked, what did the field mean to you? What did the the not just the quantity of the players, another fifteen players, but the quality of the players do to your deck choice? Did you try to metagame the field or whatever? And the most common answer was, I think that they they 
would rather play a deck that they knew and understood than try to play something wacky in order to metagame the field. Okay, so everybody knows that Wesco is going to play some version of white-green weenies. Um, knowing that doesn't necessarily give you a significant advantage if you metagame against it, because if you metagame, you have to metagame against a broad field. I think there were probably five or six different archetypes among the amongst the 16 decks. And the, the, the common sentiment was, no, I'm... I gain a bigger advantage playing the style that I like or the deck that I know rather than trying to one-off something, something different. Uh, if, if we're looking for a little more creativity in deck building, then we would have probably had to give them a format that they never played before. Home decap uh, anyone? Urza's, <laughs> Urza's Saga construct, you know, Urza's Block Constructed or something. Uh, and by the way, you're right. Uh, Wesco did play white green, um, but, but um, I, I certainly understand. Uh, going into worlds is not where you want to do a whole lot of creativity. But I, I don't know. Uh, it just seems like there was more room for more types of decks out there. That uh, I mean, with as many cards as there are in standard. Uh, a few thousand. Oh, they were playing modern, by the way. Uh, mo- well, standard and modern uh, were the two different. Yeah, um, modern, but they played last. Yeah, yeah. Um, even still, eighteen thousand cards out there in modern. There was room for a lot more than what necessarily showed up. Uh, not quite sure. I'm not co- quite sure what you're ex- what you expected. Yeah, I mean, if, if nothing else, these, al- these guys are, aren't coming in to to win a judging contest. You know, they're not they're not getting judged on their creativity. They're just getting judged on their results. Yeah, I sure. mean, uh, uh, and, no. and I certainly understand that. This is not the time to be creative. This is the time to play what wins. Well, if nothing else, it, it certainly justifies your choice at F and M. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is interesting. It, it, it's very interesting to when you get the 16 arguably best players in the world right now all together, what did they feel for the most important tournament of the year that was the best deck to bring? And I, I, I think it was interesting, some of the choices, absolutely. And I, I, I like the insight because it's not just... It, it is a little different. I mean... I was going to make a comment about the uh, the the way Worlds works now versus the old school World Championship tournament, but it's really a different field because back then you had to you couldn't really metagame in for a very small field um, like you can now, knowing that every player you play is going to be like one of the best sixteen in the world, not maybe someone who got lucky at national championship um, somewhere now. It, it, it is. It's. I think it's very interesting the choices that they chose to chose to make and play, and I, I was fascinated with just how many different actual options there were out there. But in some of them, yeah, it is. It's a. I feel like it's a justification of what you're playing at F and M. Yeah, I mean, you you go and you play your Kibler Gruel Aggro or. Your Jund or your Naya mid range or your red white blue flash or you know or whatever that you think that you want to play. Uh, I mean, I Wesco Boros Agro or whatever. Um, I you have to. I, I think one thing that Magic players don't realize is that they're better off playing something they understand. Now, at some point, you have to go into new archetypes and you have to play with new cards and things, uh, but especially for your first PTQ or whatever, or your first GP, I would definitely suggest not trying to get too tricky, but play what you know. I mean, if what you know is control, play control. If what you know is aggro, play aggro. Uh, Don't try to go too far afield. And I think that the overwhelming sentiment of the best players in the world was, I'm going to play what I know because I know that I'm not going to get any free wins in this tournament. There's nobody's, nobody's really punting a match to me here. And, uh, I, it it bore itself out as these guys had to struggle for every win they got. Yeah. Um, 
No, I agree. It, and it is that mentality. Okay, let's let's move off of this. I I want to get to the Hall of Fame. So uh, let's go to the Hall of Fame. Way better magic. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, okay. Way better magic for the next ten years. Fair. Okay. Ma- yes. My work here is done. Maybe. <laughs> How, how about we go to the Hall of Fame class of 2013? I'll be a little more specific. Okay. Um, thoughts. Did did the right people get in? Were there people who didn't get in that should have? Um, I, I know of at least one person who I thought should have got in that didn't. Um, I, I But I'd like to get your thoughts. Well, I voted for uh, – my, my vote was – published on Star City Games uh, last week, I think, or maybe the week before. Um, time runs together for me. Uh, the three guys, I voted for the three guys that got in, uh, William Jensen and Ben Stark, and of course, uh, my broadcast partner, Louis Scott Vargas. <laughs> of course. Who, who is the best thing to happen to magic broadcasting in forever. The guy is, the guy is absolutely amazing uh, at being in the booth, and we were, we were definitely a million times better because of him. Uh, it's not, and that's not taking anything away from the rest of the team, from Brian David Marshall, from Rich Hagon, from Rashad Miller, from Marshall, Marshall Sutcliffe, from Zach Hill. Uh, but LSV has a, has a natural talent and skill at breaking things down very, very quickly and uh, very, very comfortably. And I, I really, really enjoy working with him. So I voted to answer, to go back to the question, I, I voted for those three guys. Uh, I also voted for Chris Pakula. That's, and yeah, that's who I was going to mention. If the, the, the anti-Chris Pakula vote is, is, well, you know, he didn't do it long enough or he didn't have enough pro points. I will tell you, Chris Pakula has more pro points than Randy Bueller, who's in the Hall of Fame. Yep. And uh, Chris, I, I was I was very public about my support of Chris this year. Uh, he's just the guy that you want enshrined in the hall. He's the perfect example of both a great player and a great sportsman. And he certainly had sufficient results uh, in an era where it might have been a little more difficult to, to finish high. There were fewer pro tours when he played. There were uh, the, the, at the top level competition was absolutely fierce and Chris Pakula I think belongs in the Hall of Fame uh I'm hoping that you know he'll qualify at some point get those two extra pro points that he needs to get back on the or the one extra pro point that he needs to get on the ballot and uh and then get in um is it one I I think it's I'd have to go back and look at the number it's he's he was he's really close to the new threshold yeah I think I think I'm I'm reading somewhere it's like 15 Oh, okay. But um, after the vote came out, he it was almost immediately announced that he was going to be extended uh, an invite to Dublin. And my guess is they're just going to try to keep him there to get him those points to make sure that he gets back on that ballot. Uh, I'm not sure that that was that's actually beneficial. I think that's been a rumor. Uh, I I want to see again. I've been traveling. So I haven't really been reading. I'm just catching up on my reading online right now. Well, speaking of uh, pe- speaking of people whose names I can't pronounce and probably should be able to, um, Helene, is it Berjo? Berjo. Berjo. Yeah. Um, apparently, there was talk about a petition to get him on for Dublin, and her response on Twitter was, "No petition needed." Okay. So that's it, that's, that's an intimation, not an official announcement. Yeah. I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait until somebody says that he's officially in, uh, invited to Dublin. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Fifth, the first, fifth person I voted for was Justin Gary. Yeah. Now, in, in, the past, in the past, I've been sort of – he's always been an honorable mention guy on my ballot. Uh, I likened him to Bernie Williams on the, those late 90s Yankees team. Uh, extremely good but not great. And – when I went back and reviewed his numbers, uh, I was struck mostly by the fact that he had 20 top 32 finishes. That's, that's an insane number of, of money finishes for him. Uh, he played in 44 Pro Tours. He won one. 
Uh, he had a world championship. He had three Pro Tour top eights. The guy certainly has a resume, and those those 20 top 32s kept coming back to me and saying, man, this guy played at a, at a high level for you know the, the entire time that he was on the Pro Tour. And that, to me, was was worthy of my fifth vote. No, fair enough. Uh, I mean, just we've we've had just on the show as well. I mean, he's a he's a great player, a great guy, and I think he's he would be something that would be great to see in the Hall of Fame. Um, I, I I feel like he'll he'll get in. Like it won't be this year, obviously, but sometime in the next couple years or so, I feel like he's gonna he'll get past that threshold eventually. Well, well he I, he was in I, number seven for all the ballots. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I, I I'm not sure. I the problem. I think one of the problems with the Hall of Fame ballot is the player committee vote, and the the fact that more players voted for a twice convicted cheater than voted for Chris Pakula tells me that there's a problem with that side of the vote. Um, I. I really, really would like to see some Hall of Fame reform. I'm not sure exactly what it should be, but if if the players if the players committee only has the newer guys on it or the newer players on the Pro Tour on it, they don't they're not going to remember or even know about the Chris Pakulas or the Justin Garys or you know or even the the William Jensens. You know, I I think Huey, who was just one of the greatest. Magic players in the history of the game. He was a he was a guy you did not want to sit down against, and you know he was forgotten for a couple of years by the by the players committee because they didn't know him. And uh, the people voting for the Hall of Fame should be the people who understand the history of the game, who understand the entirety of it, not just the last couple of years of it. Yeah, and I mean, in even looking, like it's kind of funny because I I look at stuff like this, and um, what I'm about to say is not necessarily saying that this person necessarily should be in, but I look at a, someone like a um, like a Mark Justice, who, I mean, back in his day was one of the absolute most dominant players. His day was just so long ago that no well, one remembers was, who he is. His day was pretty short too. Yeah. I, I mean, I, one of my criteria, one of my criteria is sustained superior performance, and you know, fifteen or seventeen or twenty pro tours just to me isn't enough. Um, it, you know, somebody even even a guy with three or four top fours in seventeen pro tours is a flash in the pan to me. Not somebody necessarily worth enshrining in the Hall of Fame. It's about the Hall of Fame is about a long period of time. If, if you know, my, my threshold is about 30, and it's not a hard number. I mean, last year, if if Paolo had had 29 Pro Tours or 26 Pro Tours, I, I'd have still voted for him. But I think there's got to be a, a sustained period of performance as opposed to a, a, a short, brilliant one. Because to me, to me, and one of the, my favorite things about the Hall of Fame is the fact that that the voters do get to decide the criteria. Um, it's about it's about long term. It's about doing it over a period of time. Yeah. No. I mean, I I agree. I mean, having having a couple of good seasons is nice, but I mean, the Hall of Fame should be the best of the best of the best, and people who have consistently been there, not just for a couple of years. Right. So, okay. So let's. We've discussed that. I'd like to jump. I want to go to from uh, from the vault. Talk talk from the vault twenty for a little bit. Um, let's I'm just like the vault. What? I'm liking the vault this year. <laughs> what do you What do you think? Do you like? I mean, choices from all twenty years of magic. Well, it's a, it's a great it's a great rundown memory lane for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, it you, you see the the cards the years the cards represent and. Uh, where Magic was a radically different game 10 years ago or 15 years ago than it is today. Um, I like some of the choices. Uh, I don't think there are too many cards that I wouldn't want to play. The fact that we get them in foil is, um, 
is really cool because I can use them to pimp out more of my commander decks. <laughs> nice. Uh, that the that Therese Nielsen swords the plowshares is a is an awesome piece of art. Oh, isn't it? So I, I it really want to have that. Yeah, but uh, I'll tell you the one thing I, I did not like was the fact that they changed the art. I mean, if you're going to go back and use, um, say, Dark Ritual from 93, I want to see 93's art. Because uh, I was playing back in 93, and I loved the art well, back then. There And the new art just doesn't seem like the same card to me anymore. Well, some of that... I miss the old art. There, There's reasons for some of that. Some of that is business. Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, you know copyright things and tracks <laughs> and things and, and you know, whatnot. I, I'm sure that there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, there's more than one reason that a piece of art doesn't. <laughs> um, uh, a Chroma's Vengeance is another one that I'm, I'm really happy about being printed in this set. Uh, I think I have enough, I have enough ink eyes that I'm happy, but you never have enough Keswick Wolf runs. <laughs> you know, I, I... With twenty three, with twenty three commander decks, you know, there's a fair number of them that have red and green in it. And Wolf Run, especially with that, with the, the cool art with the with the werewolf peeking over the rock, is something I want to play with. Yeah. No, I, I, I there were definitely. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting for me because I, I disappeared from Magic for a few years, and some of these cards I was looking at, I just. I just didn't remember them. I didn't know what they were. I hadn't seen them, and it's neat. It was neat reading the reason why the various cards were chosen, and it, it was kind of weird. I felt like it was helping me get caught up a little bit on the history of uh, history of Magic some while I was away. What do you think of their choice for Planeswalker? I, uh, I think Jace is fine. I, I'm a big believer in making cards broadly available to as many people as want them. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, the fact that Jace's are so tightly held on to by people, uh, I think it was a great choice. Yeah. Well, uh, from what I'm hearing on a retail side, though, these from the vaults are going to be difficult to obtain, especially anything even close to retail. But at the very least, it is being reprinted, even if it's going to be expensive, and it does put more of them out there, which is good. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you're talking about pimping out your commander deck. The last thing I want to hit, if you don't mind, is um, at Comic Con they announced a couple of new commanders for sets that are coming out with some interesting mechanics. Um, yeah, I really like the I, I like the mechanic that they that they spoiled with uh, Jaleva and Prosh, where it costs a the, you get a bigger effect based on how much you paid for casting the commander uh, i think that's a, it was a very clever mechanic uh that brings the commander tax into into play and i, I actually as i talked to tom lapile at um uh in amsterdam and he said hey whose idea was that it was a really great idea he said uh it was actually kind of a team idea they came up with it and bad you know threw it around and uh and came up with it uh, sort of as a group well, how is how is it any different from just what the casting cost of a card is? Well, the casting cost is always the casting cost. The casting cost is what's printed in the upper right hand corner of the card. So, Prosh, you know, the converted mana cost of Prosh, which costs three and one each, one each of the Jun colors, is always six. What you paid for to play Prosh can change based on the commander tax, uh, other things in play that may reduce or increase the the cost of something so uh, helm of awakening uh, you were you only paid five for it so you you know x is only equal to five and one of the things one of the things that i think this mechanic does is it means that there's no real incentive for you to bounce uh, to, to blink or reanimate these because when they come into play you haven't paid any mana for them. Yeah. So you get X equals to zero. Which makes them significantly worse. Uh, yeah, I think the I think their upside is is pretty good. 
Uh, I did notice one thing about uh, Jaleva. Uh, it's, it says whenever she attacks, you can cast an instant or a sorcery exiled with it without paying its mana cost. Uh, here's going to be the tricky part with this. If she comes into play and exiles some cards, you pay four to cast her the first time, and she exiles some cards, and then she leaves play and comes back again and exiles six cards, let's say you recast her with the commander tax, and exile six cards, you can't cast those first four cards. You can only cast the ones that sh that this iteration has exiled because it's was, a new object and it, and it loses track of those first four that it exiled. I was actually kind of curious about that. I was going to look up the ruling for it when it came out. Well, there you, there you go. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Simple enough. Okay. Well... I know we we had scheduled here to do about uh, 15, 20 minutes. I think we've gone 30, and I, I just don't ever want to have you stop talking because uh, you are a wealth of knowledge and a great person to have on the show. So uh, thank you. for, for... My pleasure. I'm happy to come back anytime. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sheldon. You have a good night. All right. See you soon. Okay. See you again, Sheldon. Okay, so that was uh, Sheldon Mennery. Um covering a lot of magic uh, news from uh, what's going on right now. I uh, love getting his opinion on stuff. Uh, when we come back, we're going to do our Kickstarters of the week, talk a little bit about what we've been playing, and wrap up the show. Uh, you are listening to the Gamers Dome on the Drawing Board Radio Network. professional, reliable dog walkers, house sitters, or cageless in-home boarding? Check out my friends over at Leash and Lodge. They use GPS tracking for their walks, so you know they're always showing up when they say they do. With a five-star Yelp average, they're the only guys you need to know. When you sign up, mention promo code DOME to get $15 off your first invoice. Check them out now at leashandlodge.com. That's leash, A-N-D, lodge.com. Leash and Lodge, because the better way is finally here. Do you have a bookshelf full of comic books right next to the one full of video games? Are you a Whovian? A Trekkie? Do you aim to misbehave? Are you friends with Leonard and Sheldon? Do you tabletop with Will? If you answered yes to any of these, I have a new podcast for you. Digital Nerdish, the Nerd Culture Podcast, visits everything in the world of nerd. Check it out at www.digitalnerdish.com. Do you like stand-up comedy? Ever wonder what it takes to get up in front of a bunch of strangers and try to make them laugh? The truth is out there, folks, and Jake Adams brings you the nitty-gritty on his hot new podcast, Coming Up Standing. Every week on Coming Up Standing, Jake interviews another fresh up-and-coming comic like himself, hustling to make it happen on the L.A. comedy scene. Coming Up Standing is a free download available on iTunes. You can also find Jake on Twitter at YoungJakeAdams. Coming Up Standing. Listen today and get your laugh on. Welcome back to the Gamer's Dome. Oh, wow, our, our show is normally over at this point, and it, we're, we're just now doing uh, segment three. Wow. Well, we got uh, good guests. Yeah. Guests to talk about. Yeah, I, I like it. I, I, I'll, I'll take Sheldon on the show anytime. That guy is so knowledgeable. And just, I mean, he is. He's a historian of the game. He's done so much in it, and I, I just never want to. I never want him to stop talking when he's talking, because I, I feel like I learned so much just listening to him. Okay, so we're gonna kind of just blitz through the rest here because um, I want to hit hit a few things. Let's start with uh, our Kickstarter of the week. Okay, I maybe picked something I thought was funny this week. I definitely picked something I thought was funny this week. Interesting choice. I'll give it that. Uh, drag Ball, the game. An original game about drag queens. Um, I'm going to post this up on Facebook. Um, so people can actually see. Or if you just go search for Drag Ball. Um, 
Ah, oh, man. I don't know. I can't. S <laughs> Choose your queen, develop her skills, outlast the competition to claim the crown. Uh, yeah, uh, it's hard not to have an original game about drag queens. I mean, I'll give them originality. I liked watching the video. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I, um, it, <laughs> it, it's it's RuPaul's Drag Race or whatever that show was in in card form. Yep. I just yep. It, and what's interesting uh, here is with seventeen days to go, they're about half funded. There's a very good chance this game will get funded. And to be honest, I hope it does get funded. I want to see this game come to print. I think this is over, awesome that this exists. Over 50 backers already. 54 backers as of this time that has pledged $2,405. Um, answering your question, Melissa, there's nothing wrong with drag queens. It's just a very interesting topic uh, for a card game. That's all I'm saying we're done with that. Let's talk about what we've been playing here lately. Um, I'll go first because I'm already talking. So I actually learned a new game while I was in Vegas, and it is a game that probably a lot of you already knew how to play. I just somehow had never actually played it, and that's Skipbo. Just the classic Skipbo game. I had never actually played it. Um... I was up there actually playing Melissa, and she hauled it out, and she's like, you want to play Skipbo? I'm like, I don't think I ever actually have. So I played a bunch of games of that, and I enjoyed it. It was fun. It's, I mean, it's a retail card game. It's, it doesn't have the deep, in-depth strategy that a lot of other games I like have, but it's fun. Um, been riding high after last week on Flux, so I've been playing quite a bit of uh, Flux the board game and Flux the card game. And as I mentioned earlier, I've I played uh, more than my fair share of blackjack, roulette, and craps while I was in Vegas. Um, why not? It's a game. Sean, what have you been playing? Well, um, Facebook has a, a a few different types of games. They, they have your basic Farmville stuff. They have the um, the uh, the word games and the the third is the combat ones where you essentially build up a base and <laughs> go and take your troops out and fight other people's bases and I've been on one of those lately uh, one called Vega Conflict which um, is different in that the bases are all in space and so um, building up a space station essentially and mining asteroids, and uh, sending out to intercept other ships flying around through um, through a planetary orbit, which makes the map quite different. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I'll give it that. Uh, I've been playing around with it for the last week or two. Interesting. Um, is there anyone I, I know who also plays that game? You might... Uh, Vega Conflict? Uh, uh, not that I know. I, I haven't seen anyone pop up on iFriends list. Oh, fair enough. It seems like a game that I had uh, uh, somebody described to me once, but maybe it was something different. So, Interesting. Uh, there are about a million of them out there. Yeah. Uh, land, sea, pirate, uh, whatever have you. This one just happens to be in space. Interesting. Okay. Well... Sean, do you have anything else you want to add for this week? Because I'm, I'm looking at the clock here. I think we're done. Uh, just about. Um, I will say I have been playing one other game on and off the last couple of weeks. Oh, please. And I am really excited about it. It's uh, Super Dungeon Explorer. And I don't know if you've heard of this game before, but it is, uh, let's say, cute. Uh, is a good way to put it. Um, a lot of paintable characters, um, maps which get swapped around. It's something that you really have to, to get in there and play for a little bit. Um, essentially, it plays like an old game of Gauntlet on a board game. Uh, Turn-based. One guy plays the console, 
and has just a massive number of little creatures out in the dungeon. And you play as anywhere from one to five people, heroes, who have to take on this massive horde. And um, there's loot to be gained and um, a lot of cooperation, a lot of strategy, and a whole lot of fun. I got to tell you, I, I'm really loving this thing. And the customization of it is worthy of Warhammer. Uh, the painting of the different models and um, everything that goes along with that. I, I got to say, if you have a chance, check it out. They're a smaller company, um, but um, they've already put out a few expansions to it, and it looks like it's probably going to stay the uh, stay the time. Awesome! Sounds great. I'll have to I'll have to give that one a check out. So, Super Dungeon Explorer. Okay, we are at the end here. Um, I first want I uh, thank you, Sean. Um, you've you've helped with so many shows in the past, and it's good to finally have you on as a co-host for a full show. I know you did the other one, but having just you and I one on one was great. Yeah, you know I ran out of excuses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you to Sheldon Menery for coming on the show, uh, especially last second as well. Love having him on. Uh, great guy, great interview. Thanks to the advertisers. Um, thank you to oh god, everyone, Laura and Crash and Melissa, who have all like helped me out with my playtesting uh, for games. Um, until next week, uh, this is Scott for the Gamers Dome and Sean. And keep playing, everyone. <laughs>